Right here with Sonny Boy. What's cracking, you guys? From the Streets Ain't Loyal show. I guess one of the main aspects of the streets is supposed to be loyalty. And uh, you run the streets long enough, you figure out that streets ain't loyal. Damn. There's nothing loyal about it. Uh, you've been locked up. Uh, how, how, how many years have, would you say you've given to the system? If you can put a number on it. Ten. Ten years, okay. In your guess, in your best estimate, how many people would you say are behind bars because somebody was not loyal to them and they snitched on them? I want to say 90% uh, at least because the cops usually ain't around when things go down. So it's always somebody telling and it's usually somebody you least expect. Yeah. So yeah, it's a high number. Uh, a lot you want of a water dog? Hold on. Yeah, you got right, it. Cool. Yep. There's a lot of people... Uh, kept their mouth shut there'd be a lot less people locked up in prison damn 90 percent. so all you kids out there listening you have your ride or die homie your dude who's down for you if he's facing those football numbers odds are he's probably gonna talk right i wouldn't even say football numbers wow. I, i've seen some people flip on some 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 i gotta looking at 18 months for start telling out people i'm like what the hell and you have a dedicated following man i notice uh you know, you always have a lot of people in your comments showing you support. What's been uh, what's been the best thing about the Street Saint Loyal show? The the dedication that, that I get from my subscribers, man. They're uh, they're fully supportive. They're always there. They never. Uh, they're not like one day they're here, one day they're not. No, the majority of my subscribers have been there from day one, and they uh, always. Uh, show support and, and a lot of them care about the, what we're talking about the subjects we're talking about and not into the drama you know people want to push your buttons talk about you do whatever it's like but it, it's kind of defeating the purpose if I bite into it so I'm doing my best not to even though I still got to temper a little I'm learning to taper it down a lot what's your mission behind the Street Tain Loyal show if I could just help one kid for making the same mistake I did, it's all worth it. Mm. Um, hopefully I catch a little bit more than one, but if I could just catch one kid, and I, and I know I've already caught that kid, because uh, one kid's doing really good that I've been helping. That's dope, man. And you were actually going to spend life in prison at one point, correct? Yes, I had 36 to life. Yeah. Wait, let's, let's go back to when you actually uh, got that sentence what was going on in your head when you heard damn I'm, I'm gonna be possibly spending the rest of my life in prison well when I got it or when I was looking at it you know when you were looking at it let's start that uh, when I was looking at it I knew I was looking at it but it was kind of like uh, it ain't gonna happen they ain't gonna give me that kind of time uh, it, it, it's that mentality that it can't happen to me kind of thing you know I can't get killed I can't get shot I can't get stabbed I'm too young for this and then when it happens it throws a wrench in you a monkey wrench how old were you when you got that sentence 22 22 that's young my son is 23 man fuck 22 years old all right so 22 boom the judge tells you from what I understand they tell you it in months is that true or did he just say you're getting 36 to life or how does that work uh, no they said it was a 36 to life well well, he didn't say 36 to life. What he says is, you got 15 years to life for this charge. You have five years for this charge, 10 years for this charge, and so on. And then by the time it all figures out, I'm asking my attorney, what I got? 36 to life. Damn. Fuck. What was, going, what was the first thing that went in your head? 22 years old, and you're, you're, you think, damn, I'm, I'm going to be spending the rest of my life in, in jail. Well, first, when, when I got convicted, I, there was some kind of motion that my, my attorney, I had a private attorney, uh, put out saying that uh, they wanted a retrial. I guess he found some evidence that they were withholding. So they wanted to do a retrial. The judge said, uh, which by the way, stepped through the whole trial from what I could see. Uh, he, he basically said, uh, let's hope the appeals court does the right thing and I'm sending you just as, and he sent me. So, 
I remember I was bad. I was heated. Mm. I, I was heated. And I was in a, a hammer court, which everybody knows is a, munis a municipal court. But because it was a change of venue from Pasadena to Alhambra, it, it was used as a superior court. So I went and I got put in the cell. And when I got put in the holding cell, I don't know if the, the deputy had told everybody, hey, this food just got stretched. <laughs> I want to fuck with them. And everybody moved away from me. Yeah. I don't know if they could see it in my face. I don't know what it was. So I could just sit there, just looking at the ground, pissed. I was pissed. I wasn't, it wasn't hurting, nothing. I was just numb. Mm. And then uh, I went to the county jail. I was extremely tired. I laid down on my bunk. I started to go to sleep. I was just exhausted. And uh, I, I cried like a baby, man. To be mm. honest, you know what I mean? Yeah. I cried like a baby. And then the next day when I woke up, I was like, okay, whatever's clever, let's do this. Mm. Ready to do it. And, uh, Back to battle, basically. Yeah, but it really didn't settle in until 1990, the beginning of 1997, mm. that I had that time. It didn't and settle when did in. you get? When did you first get locked up? In 1992. Wow, so five years in, huh? Yeah. Was your mom and your dad uh, around growing up? Yeah. Okay. Um, my dad was always in and out of the picture. Moms would get mad with him. It was up to my dad. He'd be there all the time, but mom and dad would break up, and dad would be gone for a couple months, and he'd pop up again, and then be back at the house again. So it was always in and out of the picture until uh, he passed away when I was about 12 years old. Okay. So your mom was in the picture most of the time after that, up until the point where you got uh, locked up? My mother was always in the picture until I got locked up. Yeah, damn. What? What? Uh, if you can even explain how she was feeling when you got locked up, could would you be able to put that in words? Her son, you know what I mean? Okay, first of all, my mother was a heroin addict. My father was a heroin addict. My father died of an overdose. Okay. My mother died from complications of heroin use. But I used to see her in the trial nodding out. And the one thing I noticed about my mother was her hair completely went white. Mm. From salt and pepper to completely white in those two years. And uh, my kid's mother used to tell me all the time, your mother, your mother's worried about you. Your mother's, you know, this and that. You got to stop. And, uh, my mother pretty much lost hope on me. Uh, she told my wife, just leave him now because he's never going to change. And I know that had have hurt her. But she had told me at the same time, I'll always be here for you. Don't worry. Mm. And uh, so... She just basically lost hope in me. Mm. I think I was gonna change, you know what I mean? How old were you when, when you actually got put on? In my neighborhood? Yeah. Uh, my, I'm one of the oldest ones from my neighborhood. I want to say about 15. Okay, 15 years old, okay. If you could talk to a 15 year old you right now, what, what would you say to him? Run, motherfucker, run. <laughs> the opposite direction, <laughs> huh? If I could talk to myself, I wouldn't talk to him the way a lot of a lot of older people used to talk to me. Mm. I don't know. I always had a problem with authority. I always had a problem with the way adults talk to me. They always talk to me like I was just a kid. That I didn't know any better. That I couldn't comprehend anything. And the one thing I could tell myself, if I was going back in time and I could talk to myself, I'd tell myself, there's nobody going to show the loyalty that I showed. Mm. Nobody's going to show me their loyalty back. I showed all my loyalty. I did everything I was supposed to do. I did above and beyond trying to show my loyalty. And in the end, nobody was there for me. And I'm not talking financially or letters, or nothing like that. It's just, in the end, when I go to my daughter's graduation, I go by myself. Mm. It's my all my wife's family, and then there's me. Mm. I got no homeboys to run around with, no homeboys to, that will be there. If I slip and fall, or I get hurt, or, or I can't make the mortgage, the rent, whatever it is, 
I'm on my own. Ain't nobody gonna help me. Ain't nobody care. If you could put a number on it, how many friends and family would you say you've lost to the gang life? You know, be it death, prison, drug overdose. If there's even a number you could put on it. I want to say, and, and you know, it's hard to put a number on it because mm -hmm. I'll tell you right now. The majority of my homies and my family, I lost all of them mm. because it's, I don't talk to my brother because of it. Mm. My mother died because of it. You know what I mean? The, mm -hmm. me, me acting the way I was. She died when I was in reception center. Mm. Uh, family members, cousins, I don't talk to people. I don't talk to have my homies. I don't talk to because things get in the way. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, I pretty much lost every, everybody ever, ever held dear to me back then. Mm. All the friends I got now are basically new friends. Yeah. Mm. Was there someone that you lost specifically that hit the most? Like when you're out running the streets, like did you have a homeboy, you know, or somebody that when he, he or she passed, you're like, man, this shit is not the life. My homeboy Mono, rest in peace. Mm. My homeboy Ro Roel Ramirez, that was, uh, he died in uh, Calapatria, overdose of heroin. Mm. Uh, he was actually 90 days to the pad when he died. He had already been down like six years. That was my road dog. That was my kite. That was my brother from another mother. And he was actually supposed to come to INS yard, which I was on that day, on, on at that time. Uh, he was supposed to come down and he never showed up. And about three months went by and finally my wife was like, hey, we're talking on the phone. She goes, I'm gonna tell you because none of your punk ass homeboys are gonna tell you. I go, what? She goes, the homeboy Mona passed away. Mm. Mm. And I, I didn't even cry for my mother when she died. Mm. And I love my mother. But my father, my father, I didn't cry for really. You know, little tears, but Mona, I broke down. I was in my cell, I broke down with him. You know what I mean? That was, you know, we were tight. Mm. And I mean, we do everything together. So yeah, Mono was a, uh, it was just, man, it was, you know, it's hard to describe where, how close I was with him. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about what your experience has been like in OG, in the streets, you've been to prison, you've really lived that street life, and now you're on YouTube, and there are other people out there, you know, who've experience the same or similar type of lifestyle that you have what what are your thoughts on just the youtube genre and prison channels and and you know things like that all of us have had different experiences in prison none of us can say we've had the same experiences other other guys have done more time than others others have it rougher than others it's it's always going to be different it's never going to be the same and every prison's not the same. Um, from what I can see, most... If there's a channel out there that's pushing positivity, they're, 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 too, they're pushing it because of the right reasons, because they don't want other people to go through that kind of... Uh, that, that difficult road in life. Mm -hmm. But... We also have people that are pushing that genre that don't care about anybody else. It's just a way of them making money and getting subscribers and boosting their egos. And and those are the people that are probably the most dangerous to that genre or because that, like I said, there are some people out there that are really doing it for the right reasons. And then there's other ones that are out there doing it just to make money. And it's not a, it's, it's going to hurt the, it's hurting us in the long run because they're causing animosity amongst each other. And I try to stay in my guideline, my own little, 
my own little lane and not try to uh, judge the next man for what they're doing or, or what they're involved in. I just try to stay in my little lane and, and, and try to give people, people my aspect of, of what that life details and, and how to stay away from it. Who are some YouTube channels that you like and you think are in a direction that are, you know, going in a direction that you think is positive and First, we were talking about with Incredible Javier. Shout out, Incredible Javier. He's never did prison time, but he's got a good uh, a grip of getting a hold of these youngsters at a young time, and getting them before they go there. And uh, his heart's in the right place. We have, uh, was it LA Times? He has his heart in the right place and always want to do the right thing, but he's more of a religious aspect. Uh, Big Joe, Cholo Trucker, uh, those guys are all pushing positivity. We have uh, who else? Homie Hangout from up north. He's uh, he, he seems to just want to do the right thing in life with that. You know what I mean? I don't. Uh, other ones I pretty much don't watch too much. Uh, Sh Shadow MOD, I like him, but he's more of a street tip than anything else. Yeah, shout out to and Shadow. And of course your channel, uh, Dusty Vision. Vision. That's right. Yeah, man. You did a video the other day about fatherhood on your channel. Yeah. Can you kind of break it down? <clears throat> um. When I was living, it wasn't in my barrios. I was living in here in East Los. Um, I'm a guy, got close with this one guy named uh, Shady for Little East Side. Shout out to his son. Uh, his family members got at me because I had spoken about him one day. Just briefly. And then I ran across his son. But I had run across his son prior to that. He was riding on the wall, him and his little homies. They're, they're a bunch of punk kids, just little kids. And they were riding on my wall, I had this big blank wall, and they're riding on it. And I stuck my hand over the, the wall, tapping it. <laughs> and then as soon as they seen, <laughs> they were running. They were starting to run. And I was like, we're a bunch of little bitches now. And this one kid, he was about 135 pounds, if that. Turn around. I ain't no bitch. So we got to talking. Wanted to know why he was on my wall. And that the, the reason that other neighborhoods that stayed off that wall was just out of respect. Not because they were scared of me, just because they had respect for me. And I have respect for them. That You know what I mean? So, uh, turns out it was Shady's kid. And I had a conversation with them. They telling them that, uh, Shady wouldn't want him, his son, doing what he was doing. And because me had had a, me and Shady had had that conversation because he was having his kid. Mm. That he would he wanted to move out of the neighborhood. He wanted to do good. He wanted to do his thing and, and give his kid a better life. And and he was no punk. He was in no rank. He, he out of his business when he needed to. But at the same time, he knew there was something better out there. And uh, he got killed before he had a chance to tell it to his kid. So I told him. Mm. So my message to him was, I had run across this other kid that I knew his father too. And this kid had an unrealistic unrealistic, uh, uh, how would you say, perception of who his father was. Mm. Somebody had pumped him up and said his dad was this, his dad was that, his dad did crazy, his dad this. And, and my whole spill was like, we got to be careful what we tell these kids. Because these kids try to live up to what, they're, what they think their father was. And whether his dad was a knucklehead or his dad wasn't a knucklehead, that's not a message you should be telling those kids. 
because they already don't have a father. Every group without a father, you would be telling those kids that their father wanted something better for them. And uh, that's what that, that video was basically about, is being, being cautious about what we tell these kids about their parents, because in the 90s, a lot of uh, kids were fatherless that year, those years, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and I'm starting to see them now. I got homeboys myself that, the homeboys that got killed that their kids are already, you know, they get to that age. And I know the last thing they want to hear is, oh, your dad was down, your dad was a fool. Right. They want to they want to hear their dad wants them to do something good. They already got it rough. Tell everybody how you ended up beating that life sentence. Well, I did eight on okay. that. Uh, They had me going, <laughs> when I got convicted, it was two different shootings, well, actually three different shootings, and a bullet that can go completely, completely left. <laughs> like so, JFK shit. Uh, the bullets didn't match up. They booked me for, they put me in two different cities at one time. And they basically just withheld evidence to prove a difference. They did what they did, what they call a shotgun case. Is they got everything, just threw it in one case, and hopefully something stuck. Because I kept getting away with everything. Mm. So, uh, me, I, I copped to, to cut a couple of my homies loose. And I, I knew I was done. So I, I, copped, I copped to a couple of things to cut my homeboys loose. So I went with no crimes. And what I caught to should have was basically an assault, nothing more. And they they railroaded me into a, a murder and a bunch of attempts. <laughs> mm. So when uh, the DA had, had the evidence to prove exonerate me on most of it, he withheld it. So that's why I got out. And it was more of a sentencing modification. It went from uh, 36 to life to 15 years and then it went and I got tacked on another year for something they did in jail. Mm. Okay. So that's how it worked out. Okay. Now you've been open about this in the past. Uh, you've even mentioned it on my show before that when you were locked up you were an addict, correct? I did use for a little bit. Um, not, not the whole time. I used probably the last I used a little here and there, what they call chip. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I chipped a little. We're called that. We're talking heroin. Yeah. Okay. Just a lot, just a little. Just sometimes in jail, a lot of people get addicted because they're just trying to forget where they're at for a while, just to get away for a while. Um. It was more I got a lightweight Jones when uh, just before I was coming out about the last year. So I'm by then, I was getting a little nervous, I was a little scared, you know. I'm getting out, I was expecting to get in out. I didn't really think I was gonna get out, so it was more of just to for, trying to get by, you know what I mean? Mm. I, I ended up picking up a little habit, yeah. Okay. I was scared to get out. But one, I used to have this dream, but I, I wanna say the last year, I started having this dream that I got killed as soon as I walked out. Mm. Uh, that I got shot. I was the same dream. Then, uh, not knowing what was gonna happen in jail, you know what's gonna happen. You basically, know it's, you know what your life details, and it's, and it's always, it's almost like when you go to prison, you're scared to go to prison because you don't know what the unknown. Mm. Then when you get there, you're scared of the unknown about getting out. Mm. So when they told me I was getting out. I really didn't believe it. I was like, yeah, whatever. But in reality, I, I was scared. I was like, what am I gonna do when I get out? What, you know, what do I expect? Yeah. I got no education. I got nothing. I got my kids and my, my kid and my, my kid's mother, but my mother's gone. What if it doesn't work with my wife? What am I gonna do? I got nowhere else to go. So, you know, I was scared. Do you think a lot of people um, stay behind in prison, like commit crimes to stay behind so they don't have to deal with getting out and facing the real world? No. 
Or is that a common fear? Is, is what I should. Is that a common fear? No, I don't know if it's a common fear. I know a lot of people pick up time because their egos, their uh, pride, or what they perceive as pride. They. You don't want people saying, "Oh, uh, homeboy didn't do this just, and he was leaving that day. Why didn't he just do it?" Or. Uh, you know, somebody disrespects you and you, you walk away, then you, you get that little, even me, I get that little thing where you say, man, I shouldn't have did that. I should just rush this fool. And you know what I mean? And I'm having trouble even now at this age walking away from things where it's like, hey, okay, you know what I mean? I don't want to be getting in trouble for something stupid like this anymore. You know what I mean? But a, a lot of it's pride where there's expectations and, you don't want to let everybody down. Or don't want nobody thinking any less of you. So they got to pick up more time. When you got out, what was the biggest adjustment after serving eight years? The hardest adjustment? The biggest adjustment was people and what I perceived as disrespect. Uh, getting on the bus, people bumping you, somebody kicking your shoes whether it's an old lady or a little kid, and people think I'm kidding about that. An old lady walks by and bumps you and she don't tell you excuse you. It's like, you're not, you're not gonna go take flight on her, but you feel that, that anger, like, you know, you, you got the balls to bump me and not say excuse me. Uh, that was my biggest, my biggest gripe. And, and, uh, and the biggest thing was to walk away from my mentality of how you react to things in the real world. Because the way you react to it in prison is completely different than the way you react to it in the streets. There's two different, two different outcomes. There's, you're in the streets, you're walking, you have a problem, you try to talk it out. In prison, there is no talking. If you if you feel disrespected, out of your business, quit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You were coming up in the '80s and '90s when the streets were just really on fire. I mean, we you know, LA is crazy now, but it's nothing like it was when you were coming up. But it seems like we're heading in that direction. You know, um, all cities across the country are just seeing spikes in in crime, gang violence, and things like that. Um, if you could talk to these kids out there who are sitting in a similar position that you were sitting in 30, 35, whatever years ago, you know, what, what would you say to them? I like to tell them that. Who are already in it, so it's too late, you know what I mean? They still, if they're out there on the streets, they still have a chance to change the direction that they're going in. The, the decisions that you make right now are, are, are going to affect the rest of your life. And those are the same decisions you make right now might not be the decision you make later on down in life. Because once you get older, your mentality changes. Everything starts to change. Your priorities change. Who's important to you in your life change. That's just never going to it's never going to be the, it's, it's, as far as you get, the older you get, the more things change. And it's not going to be the same. So that anger you got towards somebody or you feel that you have to do something right there, it's, it might be different tomorrow if you just sit there and take the time to uh, think about it. Mm. Do you ever think there will be true peace in the streets? No. Unfortunately, no. Uh... I can't really get into why. Why, why it won't. But a lot of people are still being oppressed out here. And they don't want to, nobody wants to buck the system on anything. So. Everybody, they got their certain standards on the rule, on the streets. You're like this, this is the way it's going to be. And unless since somebody else sends an example, it's never going to change. If you could talk to the big homies out there, the ones who are guiding these youngsters, 
what would you say to the big homies? Respect. I'll keep it at that. Yeah. I'll keep it at that. Um, tell everybody where they can find you, homie. Follow the Streets Ain't Loyal. The show, it's on YouTube. Um, on Instagram, Sonny Boy Acosta. And um, like I said, try to, try to keep everything real on the show. Uh, stay away from the drama and just try to help our youngsters. A little bit of peace, yeah. steady job and some food to eat. Yeah. Just give me a little bit of peace, yeah. steady job and some food to eat. Just give me a little bit of peace.